Королевства Каира и до Гренландии, закованной во льдах. И на экваторе звенели балалайки, и шел по глобусу наш русский пляс. Российской кухней славились хозяйки, над миром плыл шаляпиновский бас. А к небу поднимались наши храмы, тянулись к звездам русские кресты. Лечила водка ностальгии и раны, в минуту радости и в дни тоски. И часто оскорбления сносили за темные дела наших вождей. Но, презирая их, мы Родину любили и были преданы и верны ей. Прошли года и пронесли стихии. Шум кривотолков медленно умолк. И можем смело мы сказать России, что перед ней исполнили свой долг. was very oriented towards the church and the church in Adelaide in the 19, early 1950s was the pivot of growing Russian community in Adelaide. My name is Pratilei Vladimir Didukin. I am a member of this project. I was appointed to the Adelaide in 1989. My name's Father Paul Tokarev. I'm the Reverend Deacon of the St. Nicholas Parish in Wayville, Adelaide, South Australia. I've been serving in that capacity for over five years. My name is um, Natalie. In English, it's Natalie Stanko. Um, in Russian, it's um, well, formally Natalia Vasilyevna Stanko. So uh, I was born here in Australia from Russian Ukrainian parents. Um, and I've been involved in the church for um, well, most of my life, um, but in particularly when I was 19, I was invited to join the church choir, and this is where the choir sings. I'm uh, Ksenia Meissner. Um, it is um, my married name. I was born von Sabler, and uh, I came to Australia when I was um, 11 years old um, with um, my mother and my stepfather, and I have a younger brother. After um, a um, war-torn uh, Germany and uh, lived in a refugee camp for six years and uh, of course coming to this country was like paradise. It was, it really was like paradise. It was magnificent. Uh, we, we thanked God every day and I still do that we came to this wonderful country. My name is George Burkholz. Um, I'm born to um, a family of um, immigrants that came out after World War II. My father was Latvian and on my mother's side, uh, Russian, uh, Russian-Ukrainian family um, and growing up largely inf influenced by my mother and grandparents. Um, I grew up in, in, an or in the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox traditions or Orthodox traditions. My name is Slavy Fyodorovich Adunov. I am Dina Ujigaeva. I was born in Kuwait. I came to Australia in 1984. My name is Evgeny Gubin. I came here from Manjuri, from the city of Harbina. One of the things I've learnt about Russians, wherever they go, certain Russians, one of the first things they want to do is build a church. Their faith is part of their essence, it's the core of their being. Eventually, people got together, bought this block of land, um, built the church out the back here in, a, in the position it is as a temporary church, the, uh, a Russian school behind the, the temporary church. Um, which has been replaced since. And everything was positioned to be able to let us build a permanent church as resources became available. 
The, the church is, um, is, is small and, and has a very cosy feel, but there are also a few physical reasons as to why, why it is the size it is, because there's just enough um, room, I think, on the eastern side for a car to get through, and then there's like a, a walkway on the, on the western side. And the people here really wanted to follow the traditions, so we bought a, the church was built as a traditional 14th, 15th centuries Novgorod style church. Um, people went to the effort of making sure the altar, the altar would face to the east, like a traditional Orthodox church should. Um, and in, through the 60s and early 70s, the church was built with voluntary labor, where effectively everybody of my generation their grandparents and parents um, were building the church using voluntary labour on s literally every Saturday for, let's say, round figure 10 years. With the most uh, beautiful um, church we have in Australia, it is proportion um, and also it's iconography. So it's a magnificent, beautiful, beautiful building. The Orthodox Church has, um, has a, a missionary um, component in the sense that um, you know, we don't hide under a rock, you know, so, you know, we have a, you know, the church is obviously very Russian looking and also from the, exter from the um, you know, external view that there are, you know, the domes, the cupola, there are, you know, crosses. Uh, and so, so that's um, something that's, that you don't see in normal sort of Australian type architecture for one. The building presented a certain number of problems because the location, um, I don't know the details of how the land was obtained, who from or whatever, but the records must exist somewhere in council, obviously. One of them, I think, was uh, the Raymond, his auntie, um, Ekaterina Ignatievna. Well, the church was located in 20 Barn Place City, right in the centre of the city. And um, the people that... that started the church it was mainly my auntie Catherine and then mother helped her. Right at the beginning after the um, Whitmore Square Church uh, she started to look for land and she found this land on Green Hill Road and uh, brought it before a meeting and they decided yes um, I think some people wanted it elsewhere, but seeing it's going to be um, in the centre, which is the city, uh, and that's the best place to be because it's close to everybody or, and convenient to everyone. So they did decide, yes, we'll buy this land. So again, money was raised and to purchase this block of land on which uh, the little church was built and then eventually the big church, St Nicholas, which is there now. Ну, временные церковь, вот которая сейчас вот позади вот, э, этой церкви, которая называется наш зал. И там временно они совершали э, богослужение. Но зато не надо было им э, всегда снимать, убирать, потому что уже иконостас был поставлен и на месте, и поэтому все службы регулярно продолжались. Я здесь... При храме уже около 40 лет. И все эти 40 лет я здесь работал, ну как вам сказать, делал разные работы. Когда был еще здоровый, молодой, то я... Мог справиться с любой работой. Что, что, что нужно было сделать физически, э, умственно, это я все делал. Вот 
иконы здесь висит, лампада. Это я все сделал там. И в то время, когда я, я сюда при, пришел, то этого ничего не было здесь. Церковь построила э, школу для детей, вот которая за залом тут сзади. И эту школу строили все люди, все прихожане. Я был один из них, тоже принимал в этом участие. У нас в храме стоят, три подсвечника стоят э, посреди храма. Э, два, один подсвечник и э, поддержка, как стол или что, я не знаю. Э, э, я уже забыл. Э, в общем, это все я сделал сам своими руками. И подарил это в наш храм. The building was to be located on a patch of ground which in some spots in Adelaide um, consisted of so-called Biscay soil, a rather unstable, geologically unstable bit of ground, um, so that the entire structure had to be positioned on deep piers, which went right into the, through the Biscay soil into the stable substrate to ensure that the building would not crack. In the parish, um, you had a lot of people who were professional people, engineers, builders, carpenters. So where we, you could use the local skills, it was done by our people. So it was designed by people from our parish. Uh, one of our former treasurers, um, he was actually an engineer by profession. Uh, we had some architects in the, in the parish as well. My father, Vladimir Sergeyevich Pozhedaev, uh, was an architect. My father, although he was an architect whose qualifications were not recognized in Australia, He was sent to paint farm machinery at Horwood Bagshaws in um, Hindmarsh. There were plans afoot to build a permanent building, but of course that meant having a site and having money and getting somebody to design it and so on. Um, later on in, would have been the late 50s, I suppose, a contest was, uh, a competition was set up for people to submit designs for a church in Adelaide. My father couldn't submit his own design because he was on the selection committee. The, the, he had, I think he did have a, uh, uh, a tender, but it wasn't accepted. The, the, the acceptance was, uh, the, the church was accepted by the architect Zimmerman. И они проекты нового храма, когда выстроили так, уже по, показали и так далее, то вот, значит, в то время они вот это, избрали тот проект, который нужен был для них. When a design was finally selected by a colleague architect of my father's, it was either Latvian or Lithuanian, you'll have to check that. Um, My father got the job of supervising the construction, the final design and, and construction and design of the, all the interior of the building, which, he, which occupied him for a number of years from then on. Um, in fact, he, when he died in 1972, the interior of the building was still not quite completed. Uh, the altar screen was, the design was there and the, the altar screen was mostly built, but some final bits had to be still added and finished. So my mother took that job on after his death. Uh, Pozhidayev, he built, he was the, uh, he built the iconostas, the wooden iconostas. He, that was his work all the woodwork. I don't remember him, but I, I think I remember, vaguely remember his wife. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think I, they were in they were involved. I think they were involved in the design, not only the design of the church, but I think the de main design of the iconostasis. So we've got the large timber iconostasis. Um, I think that might have been done with some external carpentry, uh, not all internal labour. My mother got the job of completing uh, the carvings. Um, most of the designs had been done, but they still had to be finalised and she had to find the carvers to do them. Um, they were done through a workshop in Norwood and the carvers, as I remember, two of them in particular, were Spanish. They did a pretty brilliant job because it was quite a difficult, uh, intricate uh, task. So the icon screen that you see behind me, the um in Russian, it's the Iconostas. Um, it's, uh, it's very warm because there's a lot of um, carved timber in it, but it's not particularly in a Russian style. Russian um, icon screens are usually much taller uh, and narrower, whereas this one is a wide one and it's um, more in the Greek, Greek style. But again, I don't know what was behind the decision to, to make the, um, the Iconostas in that style, but I know that the, the sisterhood which is an organisation of women that are involved in the cleaning of the church and um, keeping all of the, the vestments and all of the, the other things in order. Um, they used to hold events to raise money for specifically for the building of the Iconostas and that there was, a, I think, a local um, wood carver that was employed to, to do a lot of the... Um, um, you know the woodwork in the church, and I think it gives it a, a that contributes to giving it a, a, a warm feel because there is a lot of wooden features in the church. Вот, как вы видите, вот здесь панели и так далее, на панелях висели э, иконы, вот э, большинство из этих икон, которые... А стены были белого света, иконописи еще не было. И вот э, иконопись началась с того времени, как я был назначен э, в этот приход. For many, many years, all the internal walls were, were white. And every Christmas, the church choir, the choir master would get as many people from the choir that could, could sing. And on Christmas Day, they'd visit houses in the parish, sing kalyatki, a number of Christmas carols, and they would raise money. Um, and so over about a let's say a good 30 year period, the choir raised money for, for a number of things, the big chandelier that's in the church, and eventually to do all the iconography inside the church, the, all the rospis. How they did it was uh, on Christmas day, or when the service was finished, the choir would meet, uh, and that, then they would go to people's places, a lot of people asked them to come over to sing, to sing just a few carols. And that, so they would start, say about 12 o'clock, and they would finish around about 11 at night. Значит, работа была, иконописи была, проводилась одной нашей русской женщины. Antonina Ganina, I believe, and she, she came and helped as well and they, they did it in several stages so they were um, not they didn't do it all in in one sort of in one hit but they came for you know several times to to finish it off and um yeah it was it was a massive project and
yeah, I think they, they did a yeah, they did a particularly good job. The Ross piece was done by by about three or four people. It was led by a priest monk, um, Father Alexis Rosenthal, and one of the crafts he learnt as a monk was painting icons. So he would paint traditional icons, various size, on, you know, on board. When the church was, was being frescoed um, with the, the paintings um, um, on the wall, the, um, the comment, I remember there was a comment made by the, by the, um, the artists who were saying that our windows are, not, are, are too wide, they're, they're too big, so they let in too much light. Um, but I think in traditional Russian churches, they're normally a bit narrower. One of the uh, main ornaments of the interior of a Russian church uh, is the central hanging light, the candelabra, the lead, based on the lights inside the main hall of the faceted palace, Granevite Palati, in Moscow. Simplified, of course. However, unfortunately, um, it was never built in his lifetime, and then eventually they just bought a ready-made Greek one from, from uh, it was imported from Greece. Uh, quite un-Russian, but it serves its purpose. The seven-branched candlestick, uh, the candelabra which stands behind the altar, was completed when my father was still alive. He designed it and it was cut out of thick dual aluminium, but it then had to be given a textured surface, a hammered, hand hammered textured surface. This textured surface was provided by um, a gentleman who was a Russian doctor who was conscripted as a field surgeon during the Second World War into the Russian army. He was wounded and as a result of his wound, he ended up with one leg shorter than the other because a piece of bone had to be cut out. Being an extremely good looking man and slightly vain, I suppose, um, he decided that he didn't want to go limping for the rest of his life. So he took the chance of having his other leg shortened to match. When he returned from the war, his mother said, whatever's happened, my son is shorter than he used to be. Obviously, he'd lost about um, five centimeters in height as a result. His story in itself is rather fascinating. His name was, his surname was Bassiani, Bussiani. shifted around in various ways in Australia. When he arrived in Australia, he first worked as a janitor in the Adelaide Hospital because of his qualifications were not recognized. His mother, Barbara Artemyevna Baziani, uh, was, came from a noble family in Georgia. They lived in Tbilisi, and the family had servants, of course. And one of the servants had a son, teenage son, young teenage son. She was about 12 at the time, uh, Busiani's mother. And this boy aspired to go to a seminary, but he was illiterate. So to amuse herself, she taught him to read and write. No one will ever know whether the world would have been different if she hadn't. The teenage boy's 
name was Josip Josip Jugashvili, Stalin. She taught him to read and write. Anyway, her son subsequently hammered out the pattern on the um, candelabra for the Russian church. Um, and there are photographs of it. The rest of the accoutrements for the altar, the cross that stands behind it, the uh, two circular ripidi, um, I don't know what the English name is, were designed by my father, but finished off by my mother after his death. Uh, they're in flat aluminium, cut out of flat aluminium, with an embossed um, carved double-headed eagle and um, cherubim in the center. And also, uh, it, the, they were gold-plated subsequently. My mother pretty much replicated them later for the church in Canberra. In the Russian church, before a new building is, of the church is consecrated, uh, to bury in its foundations a small relic of a saint, not necessarily in most cases the patron saint of the church itself, after whom it's named. That's very seldom possible these days. And also to bury a time capsule containing a scroll with um, the description of where the church is built, by whom, how, and so on. This was done in Adelaide, of course, uh, so that there is a small, a small hole was chiseled into the foundation. I dug that out uh, behind the altar. And in it were buried in a little silver box um, a fragment of the remains of Saint Juliana, uh, Duchess of Alshans. And uh, one of our former staristers, a guy called, uh, I've, forgotten, again, I've forgotten his patriotic, uh, Ioan Nichiporenko, he was already in his, in his late 60s. He actually tied the cross onto his back and climbed up the scaffolding and climbed up at the cupola and mounted the cross, the main cross on the cupola himself. A lot of volunteers, of course, had to take part in building the church, both in the um, straight out laboring part and um, also in um, keeping the laborers happy and fed. Quite a lot of young people took part as well. Sometimes just simple things like shifting bricks from the ground up onto the scaffolding platforms for the bricklayers to lay them. My grandmother was telling me stories about what was happening on the Saturdays. So you had various ladies and babushki, they'd be cooking borscht and various food in their homes on a Saturday morning. And very few of the people at that time had their own cars in the 60s. So they'd be coming with kastrulik, big dishes full of borscht on public transport. They'd be catching buses and trains. And even from my grandmother's place, it was two buses to get to church. Um, and they'd bring the food for the people who were working here on Saturday. They'd have lunch and then just keep on going. And then probably stop on and just stop in time for the, for the evening service on Saturday nights. My father and my older brother were two people that volunteered on um, building the church and, and we had a bit of a, a, a tradition that Saturday mornings um, my father would drop my mother and myself off in the car at the central market to do shopping and then he would come here with, with my older brother and they would work and then my mother and I would walk through the parklands to meet up here and then we'd have some lunch and then we would all go home together. Um, mainly on, um, um, on Saturday 
mornings, my mother and my stepfather, uh, they um, uh, also were a part of this uh, working bee because they used to um, bring uh, um, lunch, um, prepare uh, um, something at home. My stepfather was a very, very good cook. He was Hungarian. And, and they used to bring, um, you know, this beautifully prepared lunch. And as for the ladies' auxiliary, they took turns in groups of two or three to provide meals, usually on a Saturday, when the volunteers came to the site to work. A rather a delightful practice because some of these ladies, many of these ladies, unlike my mother, I must admit, uh, were excellent cooks. And there was probably a tiny bit of rivalry in terms of presenting the most spectacular dishes. One suspects slightly that some of the people, some of the volunteers who came to work on these Saturdays might have done so out of, um, shall we say, not entirely theological concerns, <laughs> more in terms of the meals they were anticipating. On Sundays, uh, when they did have church services, the ladies, the old, everyone participated, but they sewed aprons and little babies' clothes were crocheted and piroshki were made and um, they organised lunches, anything to raise money. There, there's a lunch after the service, so everyone would come. They had barbecues and this is while they were still in the little church. Uh, to raise money for the big one that we were having. So they all worked really hard, uh, especially Raymond's parents, and, and there were many, many others that... Um, and from that it grew. It was... there was no other help. It, it was that. Catherine was always part of... Um, part of... Uh, she made it her business to be... Um, not in charge of the church, but she was always on the forefront of what is happening and what should we do next. Um, very interested in... She, she was a forthcoming lady, a very strong lady, actually. No one that you would want to cross. We came to Australia in 1900. В 1961 году. И, ну, помогали в церкви. Как все, ну, помогали. Там, значит, стряпали, пирожки продавали, это деньги собирали. Приходилось, ну, нам всем, это, все люди помогали. It was all voluntarily done. And so we have this quaint, wonderful church on Green Hill Road, yes. Mm. Стараемся так, как бы сказать, веру православную поддерживать и сами себе душу успокаивать. Но и вот так мы и живем, подумаем, как родители жили у православной веры, и так и мы продерживаем, и так мы продолжаем. Что, если что-нибудь тяжело, помолишься, вроде тебе легче делается. Так, ну, в церковь входим, потому что облегчение души и, как говорится, готовимся к, ну, к загробной жизни, как говорится. Нужна, если вы веруете, что в конце концов ваша душа найдет где-то какое место, там где-то выше. Да, и... И поэтому мы верим в Бога. В церкви я работаю уже 20 лет старшей сестрой. Я служу для церкви, убираю церковь, готовлю, на кухне работаю. Кто в церковь хотит прийти, нет, каждый должен сам себя знать. Я по своему желанию. So I've been involved in decorating the church and just following 
following the traditions that we've basically inherited from our grandparents and similarly for, you know, involved in the decoration of the church for Pascha where in the middle of the church um, just before the afternoon service on Good Friday, Friday morning we'd actually we'd had there be a reading service for the called the Royal Hours that would finish at about 10 o'clock then a group of us would come in decorate start decorating the church where um, the men would be involved in a bit of a final clean up and setting up the center area where we'd have like a commemorating the tomb set up the tomb of Christ where eventually the Plaszczynica would sit the requiem is is amazing the Russian Orthodox requiem um, and uh, um, um, I think it kind of gives people who are grieving um, a time to reflect on on the life of the person whom they have come to um, you know to say goodbye um, and so all these you know um, it it will be a continuance, um, and uh, um, people will uh, c uh, continue to come. Um, I'm hoping, anyway. In the early days of the Russian um, com community in Adelaide, virtually all members of the community, when they died, were buried in the same cemetery at Dudley Park in northwest Adelaide. That part of Dudley Park Cemetery is currently known as the Old Russian section. Uh, there is, has been some talk that it will be given heritage status. Uh, this hasn't happened yet, so that the graves are still liable to be reused when the le their leases expire. Uh, most members of my family, uh, my maternal grandparents, my paternal grandparents, and my father and mother are buried at that cemetery, as well as my uncle, my mother's sister's husband, who is, was a, a deacon at the church and who is buried near the little chapel in the old Russian part of Dudley Park Cemetery. Well, the importance of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is really to bring people together. And also the new children that are being born, um, um, their parents are baptizing them in, in the Russian Orthodox Church. They are bringing them for communion on Sunday mornings. Um, whether they will continue the children when they grow up, you probably haven't seen too many young people in like um, teenagers, but they do eventually come back. Замужем за австралийцами, и я не настаиваю, чтобы они сюда ходили в православную церковь, потому что их семья живут, они живут как австралийцы. Хочу мешаться в их собственную жизнь. Это их жизнь, они знают, что они делают. I used to bring my children, even though they they would be rolling their eyes and and uh, you know um, uh, um, complaining about about a pain in their feet. And uh, one time, <laughs> my son who was about 10 or 11, he was complaining about his, his, um, his feet. Um, uh, and then Natasha was, was as well, and she was, she's two years younger, to which he turned to her and said, it's all right for you, your feet are younger than mine. <laughs> and so, you know, and they, yeah, and, and now my son, um, is 52 and and uh, has chosen to to marry in the Russian Orthodox Church. Everything's set up to create a prayerful atmosphere and uh, create that other world, other worldy feel, that spiritual feel, and and um, 
a lot of, and just a lot of people sense that when they can come into a church for the first time and say, experience a wedding, yeah, experience a Russian wedding, the, the, the wedding service. Um, and just sort of that, the importance, say, like, uh, like yeah, Orthodox people put, put on a wedding. In the process of time, um, this, this church may not remain sort of as a Russian church, but it will always be an Orthodox church and eventually um, in the process of time that um, the services will be conducted in English. Like for example, I went to Japan um, many years ago and I went to visit an Orthodox church and it was set up by Orthodox missionaries in Japan, but all the service is in Japanese. Even though the, the, you know, the singing, I could recognise all the melodies because it's the same melodies we sing, but they've just um, put Japanese words to it. So I think over the process of time, um, things evolve and, um, and I know this is what I see sort of happening here. So I think the roots are there, but where it, you know, where it evolves to, well, it's hard to say. Why the church was set up? Basically, the, the people that came, the our Russian people that came out from Russia wanted to preserve their faith. Um, once upon a time, the thought was the church abroad would be used to, as a shell to preserve our Orthodox Christianity in, in the way the Russian people would normally worshipped, and that in the hope that one day Russia would, would be free of communism and the faith would be able to come back. But as we all know that you can't take the Christian faith away from the Russians. That the, everybody who stayed behind in Russia, that the truly devout people found a way of keeping their faith. And since Piristroika, we've seen that all the wonderful restoration work that's been going, that's been going on and that the church abroad um, eventually reunited with the, Rus the, the Russian church back in, back in the homeland. So we still maintain the, the older, old church Slavonic as a language to, that, that we serve in and we have our, old, our service books which are all in, in um, um, old church Slavonic. It would be true to say that in the 50s and 60s in particular, the church both as a a building and as a concept was the uh, central unifying factor for the Russian community in Adelaide. It served both the community's spiritual needs, whether it, the building itself was temporary or the permanent church that it is now, but it served as well as a cultural center and as a social center, both for the, I suppose, rather deprived, somewhat lost uh, older generation, particularly those who didn't speak English fluently, or not at all in some cases, found it difficult to adapt and adopt the customs of another country, but also for the young, for whom it served as a training ground um, and as a source of information about their own identity, as well as, of course, simply a social focal point to meet, make friends, have fun. So it was extremely important. Probably its significance has diminished somewhat gradually over the years, particularly when the younger generation, some of whom don't even speak Russian properly, uh, let alone Church Slavonic, which makes it difficult with church services, although the church has now started translating in English or sometimes providing in services in both languages alternately. 
and also when the younger generation started finding friendships and interests outside the immediate Russian circle. So its future, whether it remains as important as it is as it was then, um, remains to be seen. But certainly in the 50s and 60s, it was extremely important. The experience of an Orthodox Church is just not all mental. You experience it with your heart and, and, you know, and with your soul. And that's why um, the, but the beauty of the church, the beauty of, of the service, you know, the richness of the vestments, um, and then the singing. The singing should be at a high level because it's, um, as I said, it's not just all something that you understand with your intellect because your intellect is only one aspect of a person's being. Um, it's um, the church, I think, and church services and, and the worship, um, it, I think it has to touch your heart as well and your heart has to be involved. And that's why it's aesthetically it, it should be beautiful. There, there should be like nothing, I think, ugly or, you know, or... But then on the other hand, you know, we're humans and, and we're not perfect either. But we can just, we just try to do our best. That's, that's my, my view. Thank you.